We are returning to the theme of fantasy. This is an epilogue. We thought we'd finished outlining the Lacanian approach to fantasy, but there were a few nagging issues. And those nagging issues we are going to return to in this summarizing conclusion epilogue. I've subtitled it with a little help from Le Planche and Pontalis. I'm not going to sing it, but if Joe Cocker was here next door, maybe he could help us do it to the melody of With a Little Help from My Friends, which is a Beatles song, not Joe Cocker, but he sang. So here's your reference, Le Planche and Pontalis. We've used it before in these lectures. And what I'm going to suggest today is that the final pages of this paper help illuminate and help us understand two crucial puzzling elements of the theory of uh, fantasy that we've looked at so far. Two of those little perplexing moments are, we've spent some time thinking about the lozenge, this uh, mathematical formulation for a series of different types of relationships. We looked at the Lacanian uh, formula for fantasy, bard subject lozenge A, and we've also looked at Freud and various other sources which have emphasized for us that in the notion of fantasy, we have a staging of desire where it's difficult to pinpoint the subject. The subject is, as it were, distributed around the scene rather than being definitively located in one spot. That's our first perplexing question, how to understand that. Why does that arise? And the second is, how exactly should we understand this little lozenge, which seems to mean multiple different types of relationships at the same time or a permutation of different types of relationships happening simultaneously. I think Laplanche and Pantalis help us to understand both of those two questions, both of those perplexing little issues. And I think if we follow them closely and if we foreground several aspects of Freudian theory, the first and the most central will be the notion of drive, often erroneously problematically translated as instinct, but the notion of drive will be one and the second part that's going to be crucial here is the notion of erogenous zones for Freud. I've also noted polymorphous perversity here just to stress that, as I think many people know about Freud, his idea of human sexuality is that it's not, as it were, genetically, biologically set. That in the earlier stages of life, one is neither heterosexual nor homosexual, but one is, as it were, anything might go. You're polymorphously uh, perverse in the sense that you haven't yet had a settled uh, profile or, 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 or particular configuration of sexuality. So let's try and make our argument in six steps. The first is to say, and where helpful, I will try and draw directly on Laplanche and Pontalis. The first is to say that there are multiple areas of the body. We're all familiar with the Freudian notion of erogenous zones. That is parts of the body which are sensitive, which are prone to stimulation, which will be given certain types of stimulation in the biologically required uh, aspects of nurturance. As I put it here, there'll be multiple different facets of the body that can be erotically charged. This typically occurs in the erogenous zones because they're necessarily stimulated by biological functions sucking, excreting, urinating, so on and so forth. But the crucial psychoanalytic point is, although those zones are particularly uh, likely to be a kind of erotically charged part of the body, they're not the only part. Almost any facet of the body could become erotically charged in some ways. Laplanche and Pontal has put this in a really nice way. They say, and this is on the page 16 of their article, Erotogene erogeneity can be attached to various zones of the body. It could be to virtually any region or function of the body. They note that, though modeled on the function of sexuality, these areas are not necessarily the only ones, the most obvious types of erogenous zones, that could be eroticized, or as I put it, erotically charged. And then they make the crucial distinction. It's not just because there is a biological function tied to these elements, it's that these elements can start to become a focus of enjoyment or a focus of a type of jouissance. Here's my second point then. What determines this erotic charging of these facets of the body is not simply the biological function, but the enjoyment of this activity. 
then we have the sexualization of this function. It becomes drive rather than a mere instinct. And this is crucial because as we've tried to uh, suggest multiple times, psychoanalysis is not a theory of instincts, it's a theory of drives. And when certain facets of the body, often but not exclusively tied to a biologically necessary function, start to become stimulated and the subject starts to get enjoyment out of those various facets of the body, they can become erotically charged and the focus of drive rather than merely instinctual activities. So we're giving a kind of developmental background. Here then is our third argument. This is a crucial point as well. And to make this point, we'll make brief reference to one of Freud's works on metapsychology, namely his famous paper, Drives and Their Vicissitudes, often typically translated as Instincts and Their Vicissitudes. What's the point to be made here? Drives have, you could say, variations, vicissitudes, variations of form. We see how a drive, let's say the, uh, <clears throat> some drive related to sucking, to, to an orality. We don't just have it in one form, but says Freud, and that's the very reason he titles his paper, The Vicissitudes, Drives and Their Vicissitudes, is that when we have a drive, it has a variety of different polarities. It has variations of form. It can present in a passive way, it can present in an active way, such that beneath a given form, being seen, seeing, if we're thinking about uh, a kind of exhibitionist perverse urge, for example, we must also assume a, relatively, a relative form of seeing oneself. We don't have a single drive, this is my formulation, we don't have a single drive, but as it were, an ensemble. So just a very brief reference to Freud. He says, observation, this is quoting now from Drives and their vicissitudes, translated incorrectly, instincts and their vicissitudes. He says, observation shows us that a drive may undergo the following transformations or vicissitudes. One, we may see a reversal into its opposite. Two, we may see a turning around upon the subject's own self. And then he mentions also repression. He goes on to say, I'm not going to talk about repression in this paper, that deserves another whole paper. But then he says a few more words. Reversal of a drive into its opposite revolves, sorry, resolves on closer examination into two different processes. A change from activity to passivity and a reversal of its content. So any drive, we can think of here also of the fact that when Freud tries to account for masochism and sadism, he kind of puts them together in that respect. Because you can see how a certain masochistic drive or a certain sadistic drive may also be linked and one of its variation forms may be masochism. Subsequent theorists will differ from Freud on that point, but it helps just to make this idea that you don't have a single uh, exclusive drive activity, but a drive that comes with it a relative form. Other variations, passivity, activity. He goes on, we've said something about the reversal of a drive into its opposite, but he also mentions we can look at the reversal affecting not only the aims of the drive, the active aim to torture, to look at, he says, is replaced by the passive aim to be tortured, to be looked at. Reversal of content, he continues, is found in the single instance of the transformation of love into hate. So we don't need to spend an awful lot of time on that point, but isn't it interesting that when he starts to theorize and articulate the various vicissitudes, the various transformations, the various variations on drive, you could say that Lacan's mathematical formula, which in the same figure compact uh, condenses a series of relationships. It sounds like Lacan is doing a very precise, faithful reading of this idea. Okay, last three points. Naturally occurring erogenous zones are sites of social interaction with the mother, a meeting point with maternal desire and fantasy. This is how Laplanche and Pontalis put it. So we've been speaking about the erogenous zones. We've been talking about the erotic charging and facets of the body. We've made the point that Various parts of the body might be erotically charged. We've also made the point that they're not charged in simply one way. To get enjoyment from uh, giving pain may well indeed be linked through a variation of form to receiving pain, right? We've made those points. Now what we're also saying, and of course this is inherently within Freud, but Laplanche and Pantalage push it to the forefront. It's a very Lacanian point. 
any of the erogenous zones where there is nurturance, feeding, toilet training, all of these things is not just the zone of a biological function. It's also a kind of social site, a site where we have a type of social interaction with the mother. Or to put it in Lacanian terms, these seemingly biologically motivated drive activities aren't just about bodies and enjoyments. They're also about the, inter the, the, the mediation of the mother. Our fifth point then, and here we start to pull this all together. We remember from before that Laplanche and Pontala said, and there's a great phrase in their paper, fantasy is not the object of desire, fantasy is its setting. The subject does not, strictly speaking, pursue the object of its desire, but appears caught up in a sequence of images. That's what fantasy is. If we reduce fantasy simply to the picturing of an object of desire, we're, we're doing an injustice to Freud. We're missing the complexity of what's happening. We're missing the, the, what's crucial to the phenomena. What we have in fantasy, to reiterate, is not simply a picturing of an object of desire, but the setting of this pursuing of object of desire, which plays out a series of permutations of drive activity. And having made this point, having referred back to Freud's paper, on drives in their vicissitudes, we've got a sound theoretical backing to make that point. Let's see how uh, Laplanche and Pontalis put it. Fantasy, to repeat it the third time, is not the object of desire, but its setting. In fantasy, the subject does not pursue, in the most obvious way, the object of their desire. They appear caught up in a sequence of images, okay? Exactly as we put it. And this is one way of illuminating and trying to understand this distributed subject who seems to be somehow all around the fantasy without being pinpointed in one spot. Last point then, fantasy is a favored spot, say Laplanche and Pantalis, for primitive defensive reactions, such as a turning against oneself, that's a Freud, Freudian phrase we already heard when we were talking about drives, turning against oneself, or a turning into its opposite, projection or negation. Again, we have this idea which illuminates Lacan's mathematical symbol that there's a set of variations. And what Laplanche and Pontalis add to the point that we've already made by saying drives have their vicissitudes is they're saying not only do drives have their vicissitudes, but a series of primitive defenses against the drives are also present there, such as turning it into its opposite, which pretty much actually replicates what Freud is saying, uh, but here they also talk about negation. And here then, the quote that we can close with, the defenses are indissolubly linked with the primary function of fantasy. And here I've done a little diagram just to put the loss engine again. So what I've tried to do then in concluding, and I think it's invaluable this contribution that Laplanche and Pantalis make, if you want to understand the Freudian and Lacanian notion of fantasy, is I've tried to show how the role of drive and also the various variations, or the Freudian term, vicissitudes of drive, are important to understanding how fantasy stages a scene rather than gives us one object solution to a desire. Moreover, we've also tried to say that the numerous relationships that are staged in the fantasy could also be seen as having some kind of source or some kind of reference point back to the relationship to the mother or the relationship to the other. With those two points clarified then, I think we can draw to a conclusion and say that we have a better understanding both of this mathematical formula that Lacan uses, with a little help from Laplanche and Pontalis, and also the idea that the subject is somehow distributed across the scene of fantasy rather than being definitively located in any one precise point.